Hare Krishna. So today morning we'll discuss about how Shukdev Goswami gives a orientation to Parikshit Maharaj about the Bhagavatam. <coughs> Normally, if we are going to do some long course, say if we are going to do Bhakti Shastri or going to do some uh, degree or diploma, then we would like to have some orientation. What am I, what all I am, going, am I going to be taught? Because without orientation, we tend to get lost. And especially if you are going on a long discussion or a long journey, then uh, a discussion is also like a journey. You could say it's more like a mental or an intellectual journey, wherein uh, various concepts are going to be discussed. So at that time, if there's no orientation, then uh, we might enjoy the ride itself, but we will not really understand where I am going, what all places I have seen. So similarly, the Bhagavatam is going to be, relatively speaking, a long journey. Technically, the Bhagavatam starts from the first canto, first verse itself. But specifically, the central conversation of the Bhagavatam is starting from here. In the last verse of the first canto, Parikshit Maharaj asks the defining questions of the Bhagavatam. What is the duty of a person about to die? And in response to that, Parikshit Maharaj, those questions of Parikshit Maharaj, several points are being spoken. And one of the points being spoken is here, that he is, he is in that part of the orientation, generally, how do we orient ourselves? See, our consciousness is often helped uh, in it to focus by questions. Say, if somebody asks, introduce yourself. Well, okay, we might say this is my name, this is my profession. But we might be, what do I tell about myself? If somebody asks, you know, okay, which part of the world are you from? That if the questions are there, then the we can give more specific answers and the discussion can move. So generally, if we want to orient ourselves in anything, it said broadly six questions can, these are said to be the friends of a intelligent person. Who, what, when, where, why and how. So these are considered to be, uh, whenever a person wants to orient themselves, they ask themselves these questions. Okay. So who is speaking? So here Parikshit Maharaj is hearing and Shukdev Goswami is speaking. But in the, if we consider in this verse, what all is being answered? Idam Bhagavatam Nama Puranam Brahma Sammitam. So what is being spoken? It's Bhagavat Purana. So the Bhagavatam itself identifies, there is no self-identification in the Bhagavad Gita that this is the Bhagavad Gita being spoken. It is spoken by Krishna, so it's called the Bhagavad Gita. But the Bhagavad Gita does not self-identify. Self-identify means that there is no there is no verse in the Bhagavad Gita say, which says that this is the Bhagavad Gita being spoken. There's the what is called the solo, colophone at the end of recitation of each chapter where you say where you say Brahma Bhagavad Gita, but that's not intrinsically what Krishna spoke to Arjuna. So, but the Bhagavatam self-identifies itself. This is the Bhagavat Purana. Idam Bhagavatam Nama. And then, okay, what is the, the, what is the name of this book? What, what, is, what is the content of this book? Puranam Brahma Sammitam. It is about Brahma, the ultimate reality. And when was it spoken? How was it spoken? So he says, that, that it was spoken by Dvaipayan and I heard it at the end of the Apar Yuga. So you know, end and beginning, these all these depend on the reference points. So the example that is given here by Jiva Goswami is, and Prabhupada quotes in his purport is that, so if we are looking at a building or a tree from the top, and the first thing that we see is the top part. Now we can say the building begins from there or we can say the building begins from, begins from below. So when is it spoken, by whom is it spoken, these questions are being answered over here. And the most significant part over here is Prabhupada takes the point that he, Shukdev Goswami has learned it from Vyasadeva. And similarly, we need to learn it from uh, the, we can need to learn it from a proper tradition, from teachers within a tradition. And the previous verses talked about who who is it who so we can when we have the who question can be who is it that is teaching it, who is it that we can study it. 
So normally if we are joining some course in a university, we may want to know who is the faculty, what are their qualifications. Then we may also want to know, okay, who are the students, what is their eligibility. Now, if is it like a, is it adult learning course, say if we are 30, if you are 40, 45 and we are joining and everybody else is maybe 20, you might feel a little out of place over there. So who is, the, who are the students? So the students is, a, so Parikshit Maharaj is himself a student now and he, although he was a very greatly powerful and a wealthy king, he's renounced it all to focus on hearing the Bhagavatam. And he is giving an example, generally if we want to join some course, we want to know, okay, if, who, those who graduate from this course, what do they achieve? What kind of jobs do they get? What kind of career do they have? What kind of life do they have? So similarly here the point being made is that Shukdev Goswami himself was a person who had you could say graduated out of material life. He, he, he didn't have to graduate out of material life through experience and realization. He in his mother's womb only had graduated out. He was so spiritually evolved that he was completely detached. But still he was attracted to the supreme. So he is the, so if you look at the questions, uh, who is speaking, who is hearing, who, so that is answered, what is being spoken, that will be the most important question which we will focus on later once again, but Puranam Brahma Samitam, when, so this is, the Bhagavatam itself is eternal, but it is spoken at particular times in history. So, Jiva Goswami in his uh, Shat Sandarbha says that this is this Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is the Channa Avatar. Hmm? So Bhagavatam is the Channa Shruti. Although technically it is a Smriti, it is a part of the Puranas. But essentially it is Shruti. It is eternal message. The Puranas, they themselves keep changing according time, place, circumstance because they are spoken according to time, uh, the whole point of Puranas is, it's called as, sorry, Smruti is recollection, which is Puranas. That means, those who have heard something, they hear it and then they recollect it and they speak it according to time, place, circumstance. When Bhakti Siddhanta Thakur was asked about this, he said that, just like if we speak right now, so language also evolves. So if somebody starts speaking, you know, how are the? How are the? He says, are you missing one century? Why are you speaking? How are you? The is something which was used maybe in the early 20th century or the 19th century. The, thou, thy. So language changes. So similarly, his Sanskrit has also evolved over centuries. So what happens is, the Puranas are written in relatively recent Sanskrit. Whereas the Vedas themselves are written in relatively older Sanskrit. So when Bhakti Sanskrit Thakur was asked about this, so, uh, so the inference that scholars draw from it is that the Puranas are recent whereas the Vedas are very old. But Bhakti Sanskrit Thakur says that the, just as the soul reincarnates, similarly the Puranas also reincarnate. What that means is that the Puranas because they are Smriti, they are spoken according time, place, circumstance. So the essential Puranic message is eternal but depending on when it has been spoken. There is an oral tradition and there is a textual tradition. So in the Puranas, when the Puranas are written down, the textual tradition is what is recent. The content itself is not recent. The, uh, the way it was phrased, that is recent Sanskrit. But interestingly, the Bhagavatam, although it is categorized as a Puran, it is not in, it is not in recent Sanskrit. It is actually, it, its Sanskrit is quite Vedic. So, if somebody wants to learn Sanskrit tra tra traditionally, they are, they have the books which are recommended for learning Sanskrit are maybe something like uh, Ramayana or the Padma Purana or something. The Puranas are generally very simple Sanskrit. The Vedic Sanskrit is very difficult. And the Bhagavatam Sanskrit is also not very easy. It's like, what do you mean by easy Sanskrit and difficult Sanskrit? It's just like if somebody wants to learn English. If a child wants to learn English, then there are some simple children's books with which we start. Or there can, if there's a, if a general newspaper is there, well, that's not so difficult to read. The words will be familiar. But if somebody is writing, the, is going to read maybe a 
a book written by a scholar for another scholar, maybe an academic journal paper. That will be much more difficult Sanskrit. So the Bhagavatam Sanskrit is quite difficult. In fact, Monier Williams uh, was, uh, was considered the first modern Sanskritist. And he was a European who came to India, learned Sanskrit. And he made a Sanskrit dictionary, which is considered even now the standard dictionary, Monier Williams dictionary. So what happens, it's uh, so fascinating that sometimes if you look at the Bhagavad, um, it has some word which is not very common. And if you look at the meaning, the Monia Williams dictionary will give a meaning. But then generally what happens, to understand how a word is used, you also need usage. Many times people who just uh, try to expand their vocabulary by memorizing word lists. What happens, they know the meaning of the word, but they different words have different connotations. If they don't understand the connotation, they use the word in a very inapt way. So, now, so if you want, so Monier Williams Dictionary has the word and it has its usages. Now, sometimes there are, there are at least like several hundred words in the Bhagavatam, which if you go to the dictionary, you look at the word, meaning is given and if you look at the usage, it refers back to the Bhagavatam itself. So, those words are not found anywhere else except in the Bhagavatam. So, those are very rare words. So the Bhagavatam has its own standard of elevated Sanskrit. And it is spoken Puranam Brahma Samhitam. Now why is it like this? At one level, the Bhagavatam is spoken for the masses. But it is, although it is spoken for the masses, it is not just for the masses. It is for the mass and the class. That's why among all the Puranas, if we look at the various Puranas, the Bhagavatam has the most philosophical sections also. The Bhagavatam has a lot of philosophy. The Bhagavatam is often celebrated for its 10th canto, which has beautiful pastimes of Krishna. And in fact, nearly one third of the Srimad Bhagavatam is 10th canto. There are 335 chapters in the entire Bhagavatam, out of them 90 are in the 10th canto and numerically 10th canto is the largest and most people who cherish the Bhagavatam, most Bhagavat Kathas are either on the 10th canto or they are on some of the other story like Dhruva or Prahalad but the Bhagavatam itself has many philosophical sections. Mm -hmm. Broadly speaking, there are uh, five sections which are considered especially philosophical and the two most prominent among them are the Kapila Devuhuti Samvad and the bigger, bigger than that is the Uddhava Krishna Samvad. Mm -hmm. Now of course there are others also which are very philosophical but the point I am making over here is the Bhagavatam it is, it is Puranam Brahma Samhitam. It is, it is telling us the stories about Brahma, about the Supreme Brahman Bhagwan, but also giving us the philosophy, the Tattva. And in that sense, well, the Bhagavatam is a Channa Shruti. Shruti means it is, it is like a Vedic text. It is like the Shrutis, which have a lot of philosophy within them. The Upanishads have elaborate philosophy among them. And philosophy means uh, that often things are explained in a way that is adequately complex to attract people with complex minds. What does it mean? <laughs> that you might say Radha Krishna is the Radha Krishna is the divine couple. That's a simple way of saying it. But now, if somebody is very intellectual, eh, divine couple, okay, not this. So you say that Radha is the primordial cosmological feminine principle, and Krishna is <laughs> Krishna is the primordial cosmological masculine principle. Oh wow! <laughs> <laughs> so that sounds that sounds about impressive. So in general, you will see that the Upanishads have passages which are quite difficult to understand. And some people, unless there is something difficult to understand, they don't feel stimulated. <laughs> <laughs> if everything is simple, they get bored. <laughs> so for those who want something intellectually challenging and stimulating, the Upanishads are there. 
and Bhagavatam also has sections like that which are quite intellectually demanding. So basically what the Bhagavatam is doing is that it is a Puran but it is unlike any other Puran because it integrates the Puranic stress on stories also with the Upanishadic stress on philosophy. So pastimes and philosophy are both integrated over here. So Brahma is depicted or described through the pastimes and Brahma is described even through the philosophy. So broadly, you know, how do we come to know about a person? One way is we can directly know the person. Can We can meet them, how do they look, what, what all do they do? That's one way of knowing a person. Another way of knowing a person is to know about the position of the person. Hmm. Say if you, if we come to know, okay, this person speaks very nicely, has got, is looks elegant, and is this this. We might think about this, but then you come to know, okay, this person is the CEO of this company. Okay, so now the name CEO sounds very big. So you know, many people like to. There is the quality called dumbha. Dumbha means people want to appear bigger than who they are. So I was at a I was at a corporate conference and then afterwards I was talking as in, in Singapore. So then this person came, we were talking with this person, this person said, I'm a CEO of a company. And I talked with him for some time. And then I, the devotee got organized. So I told him, you know, I, told, I told him who, who, after the program we were talking. So I told him that I'm, I'm, we, we, who all had come, who were really interested. So he told me, yes, I, I told him about this person. Yes, he's the CEO of the company and he's the sole employee of the company. <laughs> <laughs> so, sometimes somebody might claim a position, but that position might not, might not be meaningful. But generally, we get a sense of a person by understanding their activities, understanding their personality, but also understand it by understanding their position. So, the Bhagavatam spends a good amount of time to explain the position of God, position of the absolute truth. And the idea is both by understanding the activities as well as the position, we can learn more and more about the absolute truth. And this particular chapter is called the first step in God realization. And later on, as we will see, the Bhagavatam will move toward <coughs> describing uh, how God can be seen in this world. The, the idea is that most of people do not, uh, don't become directly interested in God. Very few people suddenly wake up one day and think, oh, does God exist? It's like when they are trying to live in this world and while living in this world, they find that things don't work the way they wa want them to work. See, broadly speaking, our life, we can divide into there is order and there is chaos. Order is where that area in our life, when we do something and we get the expected result. So when the cause effect connection is well known for us, that's where we can have order. So I, I call somebody on the phone and that person picks up the phone. The call goes through and pick up the phone, that's order. But I call someone and the person doesn't pick up the phone. You say, what's happening? I call someone and the call doesn't go through. I call someone and my phone is not working. So basically when we, when, when we do something and we don't get the expected result or we don't know what results are going to be there, that's when disorder starts happening. So for all of us, when we function in the world, we try to create some order in our life. And it's based on that order that we function. So this order is vital. Say for example, all of you are sitting and hearing this class. Now every one of you is reasonably confident that suddenly the person next to you is not going to turn at you and slap you in the face. <laughs> <laughs> now, hypothetically, might say it's possible, <laughs> but it's very unlikely. And because that foundational order is there, so that you can focus. 
imagine if you are sitting and you you are afraid the next person will slap me then you would not be able to focus at all so we need a certain level of order so that we can function but we don't want things to be completely orderly also say for example if before you came to this talk you knew every single word that was going to be spoken in this class then you will feel what is the point of coming here i want to learn something so there is now chaos doesn't necessarily mean it's complete disorder it's just that when we do something what is the result that is going to come we don't know that mm -hmm. so there has to, we all need some amount of newness in our life so the disorder that is there that is what brings about some newness but the order that is there that brings stability and even in our relationships we need both now, if people are completely predictable if i say this they're going to say this if i do this they're going to do this if people are completely predictable then life be then becomes boring but if people are completely unpredictable then life becomes life becomes very worrisome we just don't know what we are going to do so say for example right now there is a basic structure that you are going to you going to come for a bhagavatam class you going to hear something about krishna and uh, with this framework okay i want to learn something new so what the bhagavatam is tell, uh, doing is is so when do we people when we when i'm talking about uh, when do we start thinking about god normally wherever there is order for us okay i do this i get this result at that time there is no need to think about anything higher but when we encounter disorder Now some people love adventure. Some people don't love adventure so much. Different people are of different natures. But still, when we encounter disorder, and disorder starts, uh, chaos starts overwhelming us. That is the time we start thinking: Is there something? Is there something more in life beyond this chaos and order? Is the uh, order and chaos? Is there some higher governing principle? So when we are not able to do. what we intended to do or what we intended to do does not get the desire gives us the desired results that's when we start seriously thinking about god of course another way is also that even when things are going orderly in our life we may understand that this order is also sustained by god but at that time we may not think so seriously or call out to god generally we call out when there is a disorder so what the bhagavatam does is that it it doesn't start with god it starts with the world prabhupad writes in on the way to krishna that uh, all knowledge comes from god but all knowledge doesn't begin with god whatever knowledge anyone has it is god buddhir buddhimatam asmi mattah smutir gyanam apohanam cha it is god who gives all knowledge to everyone so all knowledge comes from god but all knowledge doesn't begin from god our knowledge begins from the world around us we observe the world we think about the world and then we want to know what is more about the world so th so when we observe the world and we just want to make sense of why is there order in the world and when there is chaos is there some ordering principle beyond the chaos that's when we start thinking about some higher reality that's when we start thinking about god so the bhagavatam in this uh, bhagavatam basically as i said that it talks about the position of god and it talks about the past times of god and in a sense it evolves the first few cantos focus more on the position of god and position in terms of how we can meditate on god while functioning in the world or while interacting with the world while observing the world it offers us three ways of meditating the second canto this is where we will see the virata roopa the universal form is where we look at the world and we see the hugeness of the world and that points us to somebody huge so the idea that oh the mountains are like the <coughs> the mountains are like the bones of the lord's body the rivers the oceans are like the water in the navel of the lord the trees are like the hair on his body this is a meditation which enables us to understand the hugeness of god now this is kalpitaha this is actually not a real it is not that god has any form like that there is no like we have satya loka jana loka tapa loka there is no virata roopa loka there is no abode where the virata roopa resides so 
there's a verse in the in this can canto itself which says this is how the lord is envisioned so great seers envision the lord in this way now the virata rupa which is described in the bhagavatam and the vishwa rupa that is described in the bhagavad gita they are similar and dissimilar the similarity is that how god's greatness can be seen in connection with the world how the whole universe is contained within god that is depicted in both but the virat rupa is a conceptualization whereas the vishwa rupa is a revelation virat rupa is a conceptualization means that the seeker thinks okay this is like this this is like this, this is like this and that's why you will see with this virat rupa is described primarily in the second canto but throughout the bhagavatam in many prayers the virat rupa is described but at different places sometimes it may be said that okay this particular loka is the shoulder of the lord but some place it might say that particular loka is the chest of the lord so that is why is that different because it's a conceptualization so the virat rupa is described in the bhagavatam is a conceptualization we look at the vastness of the world and we try to we see that this is god's greatness manifesting whereas the vishwa rupa is described in the bhagavad gita is a revelation krishna says dashtum ichhami te rupa and arjuna says that i want to see it divyam dadami te chakshu pashyame yogam aishwaram i give you the eyes the divine vision by which you can see and he is able to see at that time so that is the wish that is the uh, the difference but either way the point is the first step in god realization is we look at the hugeness of the world and we want to understand what is beyond this world is there anything beyond this world and that reality which exists beyond this world that is god at one level god is best understood first as the principle then as a person now of course for developing a personal relationship approaching god as a person is good but for somebody who doesn't understand god as a principle they might think of the person as the personal conception as sentimental or sectarian or oh, you people imagine god is like this oh that is your conception of god that is their conception of god i was at a at a conference on spirituality and uh, mental health and i had an interfaith conference so i was talking after that with one prominent spiritual teacher from the buddhist tradition and then he was telling me that we buddhists have one big advantage over you i said as because we also talk buddhists talk a lot about mindfulness and mindfulness has become very big in the western world now our tradition also has a so quite a sophisticated understanding of the mind hmm? but somehow uh, mindfulness of the buddhist tradition has become very big so we were discussing also we have one big advantage over you says so what is that says we don't have god <laughs> <laughs> so there what he meant by that was that we don't have god means as soon as you bring god into the picture people start thinking of it as thinking of it as sectarian oh you have your god and we have my god and then there is a conflict of course now god is not a disadvantage god is the supreme strength for everyone but contextually so what happens is many many atheists who want to be religious they adopt buddhism or people who don't want to affiliate with any particular denomination they adopt buddhism and they feel that we are spiritual so there is a whole genre of people who call themselves as spiritual atheists <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> now it's it's a it's a it's a oxymoron actually to say that you're a spiritual atheist it's as to say that somebody is a spiritual atheist is like saying that somebody is a brilliant fool <laughs> the two ideas themselves are intrinsically contradictory hmm? so because why is it contradictory because whichever major tradition in the world we go to we talk about theism theism is centered on accepting god as a spiritual reality so if somebody is atheist usually they are materialists and if somebody says i am spiritual atheist then it's a contradiction in terms but the point i'm making here is that 
द भागवत दैट वेन एवर वी स्टार्ट टॉकिंग अबाउट द पर्सनल कंसेप्शन टू अर्ली देन पीपल स्टार्ट थिंग दिस इज सेक्टेरियन इज इधर सेक्टेरियन और इट इज सेंटिमेंटल ओके वी ह्यूमन बींग्स आर ह्यूमन सो वी हैव इमेजिन गॉड टू बी अूमन बींग दिस इज एंथ्रोपोमोर्फिक इज जस्ट योर सेंटिमेंट बट इट्स नॉट लाइक दैट इट इज वाई डू वी हैव अूमन फॉर्म बिकॉज वी आर मेड इन द इमेज ऑफ गॉड but uh, so what is the way out if you see the bhagavata i mean its first verse om namo bhagavate vasudevaya is the invocation but what it is the subsequent uh, the whole first verse describes the position of god not the past times of god janma dyasya tanvay tartas charteshu abhigya swarat the whole verse is telling about the position the principle what what do we mean by god so god is the source of everything god is the word, god is the reality who gives reality to everything god is the being who who is the shelter of all being so like that the bhagavatam gives very universal attributes and in that sense if we consider everybody considers something of the highest value and whatever anybody thinks is the highest value is their god so for example if somebody thinks that money is the most important thing in life and they are going to do anything and everything for money then what happens money is their god mm. if they are a little religious they will worship lakshmi uh, but otherwise they just think money is their god for somebody who is who is very much having idea of power as the greatest reality then power is their god for somebody who is an addict alcohol becomes their god they may not call alcohol as god but you know when somebody is addicted a addicted person thinks of the object of addiction much more intensely than a devotee thinks of the object of devotion <laughs> 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 so they are offering that same constant thought to that uh, even if you give them other things to think about but their thoughts come back to that as soon as possible a somebody who is a very strong addict as soon as they wake up the first thing they think of is their addiction and as soon as you go to sleep the first thing they think of is before sleeping the last thing they think of is the object of addiction <coughs> so everybody has something which they consider is the highest value now we may consider something to be the highest value but is it actually of the highest value? so this conception our conception of what is the highest value and what is actually the highest value this sometimes comes in tension sometimes we go along with our say somebody consider the wealth is the highest value and yes by by having money you can get your desires fulfilled but then suppose somebody gets a disease that is incurable no matter how much money you spend still you can't that this is not cured then we see that money we are treating money like god but it is a false god we thought is the highest value but it's not going to last for us so what the bhagavatam depicts is uh, i conclude with this point from parikshit maharaj perspective and shukdev goswami's perspective that parikshit maharaj generally there is bhukti and there is mukti bhukti is material enjoyment mukti is cessation of material miseries liberation or material miseries so now uh, parikshit maharaj was never a sense enjoyer but parikshit maharaj was in such a powerful position materially as the emperor of the world that we could say that he represents the pinnacle of the facilities for worldly enjoyment he had it all and he gave it all up now Shukdev Goswami was the supremely renounced person. He was so renounced that he didn't even want to come out of his mother's womb. Why? Because he felt that the world is a place of illusion. I was at a, uh, I was I had gone to one big builders uh, conference. and there they they had asked me to speak so they uh, what had happened was behind that they had written we build houses as comfortable as your mother's womb <laughs> as comfortable as your mother's womb 
now 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 what is happening over here is the bhagavatam says the the what the, the the child in the wombs is in a state of great suffering yes. now actually speaking is it a great suffering or it is not great suffering you know but if we look at it simply from the biological perspective nature has designed the womb in such a way that the womb is quite a comfortable place you know the infant is very tender and the infant has to be protected so nature does so in that sense if you want to consider the embryo simply as a biological entity then the womb is a comfortable place but if you consider the embryo to be a conscious being then for a conscious being to exist in that constricted space that is not at all comfortable so the bhagavatam is speaking from the con perspective of consciousness whereas this particular advertisement was from more from the biological perspective Just consider the embryo to uh, the embryo to be just like an object. Oh, it's in a very soft, cuddly place. But so the, anyway, the point I was making is that um, that when we that that from the script spiritual perspective, it's understood that although the womb is a very uncomfortable place, but still Shukdev Goswami was so detached that he preferred staying there, so that better to have discomfort with freedom from illusion. then comfort with illusion we have comfort in the world but along with it comes a lot of illusion so he was completely detached from the world so we could say that the uh, shukdev goswami represents the liberated souls he was already mukta he was he had no attachment to any nothing material at all but both so so people conventionally would have these two trajectories that path of material success and the path of spiritual success the path of spiritual success culminates in liberation the path of material success culminates in immense unrivaled material power but these two people who had attained the zenith of their success in the material and the spiritual world they are coming together and both of them are rising to a still higher success that is there is spiritual success but beyond that there is devotional success and devotional success is not just liberation or material existence but absorption in the supreme spiritual reality so shukdev goswami is going to speak and through the speaking he is going to be absorbed and parishit maharaj is going to hear and through that hearing he is going to get absorbed and in that way this puranam brahma samhitam that puran which talks about the ultimate supreme reality is going to be spoken and it is by shri prabhupad's mercy that is bhagavat puran was made available all over the world and we are able to relish its wisdom and direct our thoughts our consciousness towards transcendence so i'll summarize i spoke today on the theme of the significance of the bhagavatam <coughs> so we started by talking about how when we want to understand when when we are doing any course or going on a journey it's helpful to have an orientation so the bhagavat this chapter of the bhagavatam is offering us an orientation we can orient ourselves broadly by asking six questions who what when why why and how so this is this series of questions uh, series of verses by shukdev goswami is giving answers to these questions so who spoke it shukdev goswami is speaking it parishit maharaj is hearing it but shukdev goswami heard it from his teacher that is vyasadev oh, and then when was it spoken at the end of dwapar yuga at the start of kali yuga uh, and then what is it about that was what we focused on primarily in the class what it is about the ultimate reality <coughs> brahman and in while discussing about the ultimate reality i discussed uh, about how the the bhagavatam describes god as a person and describes god as a principle or the position of god in both ways we can come to know about god and that way we get a complete understanding of god if we focus only on the personal aspect then people may think this is sectarian or sentimental but when we focus on the position the position is universal how is the position universal because god is the object of the supreme value so everybody has some object which they consider the supreme value but that object lets them down sooner or later whereas god is the object of who is eternally the object of supreme value and he will never let us down and how does the bhagavatam start describing the position of god it starts describing by describing in relationship with the material world uh, all knowledge comes from god but it doesn't begin from god 
So while living in the world, there is the domain of order and there is a domain of chaos. Order is where the things that we do give the expected results. And chaos is where the things don't give the expected results. So normally when we encounter chaos that is unmanageable for us, that's when we start thinking, is there some higher organizing principle? That's why distress or dissatisfaction with the world is a primary impetus for turning towards God, exploring higher reality, sometimes ex as exploring a higher reality. Sometimes even the order itself, if we are pious, we understand this order comes from God. So this first, first step in God realization will be that the Bhagavatam looks at uh, the world as the body of God. I talked about how the Virata Rupa in the Bhagavatam is a conceptualization. The Vishwarupa in the Bhagavatam is the revelation. And this Virata Rupa is one of three ways in which the Bhagavatam describes how God can be understood as in terms of his position or his principle. And lastly, I concluded how this discussion between the two of them, Parishad Mahayana Shukadeva Goswami, is like a discussion between somebody who has attained the summit of success in material life, that is the, uh, the hearer, Parishad Maharaj, and the person who has attained the summit of success in spiritual life, that is Shukadeva Goswami, who is already liberated from illusion. And both of them are coming together and they are ascending toward the summit of success in devotional life by becoming absorbed in the supreme absolute truth. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Any quick questions or comments? Yes, yes Mataji. I was just wondering what did you answer to that Buddhist who said that the problem with your religion is that you have God. What, what answer did you give him? Okay. <laughs> so, <clears throat> what answer did I give when he said that the problem with your religion is God? So, I think we also need to present God appropriately. So, what I, whenever I go to uh, programs like yoga studios or somewhere like that, then I don't talk about Krishna as a Hindu religious God. I talk about Krishna as the object of loving yogic meditation. So, if you talk about, if you, you, uh, in fact, we conscientiously avoid using the word God. Somehow the word God has become a bad word in today's world. You know, if you say that the Star Wars, they say, the force is with you. <laughs> if the Star Wars had said, God is with you, the audiences with the, the theatres would become empty. People would not be interested. So, so, generally, if you consider, meditation is quite cool, yoga is quite cool, and love is always cool. <laughs> So you present, don't talk about Krishna as God, but talk about Krishna as, Krishna, so we are, in a, we are in, a, in a yogic tradition and in this yogic tradition for, th for thousands of years, people have meditated on this conception of God. So you present Krishna as the object of yogic loving meditation. So we are not saying that, this, so the basically there are two objections to it. It is sectarianism, that, that sectarianism is the main objection, sentimentalism is the other objection. So how do we deal with the object, objection of sectarianism? That is by primarily saying that this is a conception, there can be many different conceptions of God, essentially the attributes of God are one, but then that becomes an object of discussion further. But what he says is that this is a conception and this is a conception that has helped many, many seekers to raise their consciousness. And if you, uh, you present it that way, more in a descriptive way rather than a prescriptive way. Prescriptive is, this is what you should do. Normative is, this is the truth. But descriptive is, this is what has been done, this is what has worked for many people, this has worked for me also, why not try it out? So, see like many, many people are, may, who may not be very religious and willing to come to a temple and worship Krishna on the altar, they are okay chanting mantras. They are okay doing Kirtan of Hare Krishna mantra also. Because somehow Kirtan is seen as, it is seen as spiritual. It is seen more as non-sectarian. Even if you are chanting the names of a, chanting a particular mantra. So basically, it, we just need to present it appropriately. So we, especially with new people, it is best to avoid the word God. What we focus on is sometimes infinite consciousness or sometimes the ultimate reality. Absolute truth also seems a little bit uh, uh, imposing. How do you know it's the absolute truth? But so a uh, gentler way of phrasing it is ultimate reality. We are all searching for some ultimate reality. And this is the Bhakti Yoga tradition offers this is the ultimate reality. 
even those Christian churches that have been successful, they have also rebranded God. There's an article in New York Times about this, about how God was traditionally portrayed as the cosmic supplier or the cosmic provider. Oh Father, thou art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, give us our daily bread. Now, at a time when most many people were poor and there was a lot of shortage of food, God as a supplier of bread makes sense. But in today's world, especially the Western world, most people are not worried about bread. <laughs> if they are worried, it is about butter. <laughs> so what the many churches are presenting God not as the cosmic supplier, but as the cosmic therapist. 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 You go to God and you'll get peace. You approach God and you get can deal with your mental issues. So we all need to learn to present God appropriately. Prabhupada is also expert at this. You know. Prabhupada, he, when he went to America, he presented Krishna consciousness as stay high forever. It was basically, uh, it was basically drug lingo over there. You, know, you take drugs and you go high. So was it stay high forever. So we, if we present things appropriately, then initially, whatever are the conceptual barriers that hold people back, we can avoid those conceptual barriers. Okay, thank you. You had a common question or comment? Yeah. I was kind of on the same topic, so you answered it. Oh, okay, thank you. You had one question? You had another? Yeah, we'll complete it. Yeah. Just when you when you saying that um, you know, God never lets us kind of intangible concept even to, to a devotee, even though we've got all so much knowledge, so we can sort of grasp the real meaning of that in the ultimate sense. But when you talk to people uh, and, you, and you say that, they could very easily question that, oh, I'm suffering so much, I've lost, you know, my loved ones, or I'm dying or something, so they could see that actually okay. that does that. Then okay. how would you sort of That's true. That? Yeah. yeah. So if we say that God never lets us down, if we say that, but then people they pray and still their loved ones may die or they get a lot of suffering so how do we understand that how can we explain to them a lot depends on our conception of god most people as i said approach god because they have some problems which they are not able to deal with and they hope that god will deal with those problems for them so now this is this is an okay way of approaching god that's the way most people will approach god <coughs> that but the terms of this relationship are that God, are, we have these people have some faith in God's power, but not faith in God's wisdom. That means we are forming a relationship with God. The terms of the relationship are God. I have this problem, and this is a solution to this problem. But I don't know. I can't implement the solution. You implement it for me. So the terms of the relationship are my intelligence and your power. <laughs> <laughs> so we are trusting God, but we are only half trusting God. We are trusting God's God's power, but not His wisdom, not His intelligence. And because of so, now it's good at least to trust God at that level. But that is not a. It will work for some time, but after some time, it may not work. And that's why <coughs> Scripture does offer us occasions where the protection that comes is not material. If you look at the whole Bhagavatam story itself, it's like sometimes you may have some adventure novel or something like that. You know, okay, the hero has to get to this treasure pot within one week. Without that, the hero will die. And then the hero fights against various obstacles and finally gets to the treasure pot. And then he's saved. The Bhagavatam begins with the hero cursed to die in seven days. And by the end of the Bhagavatam, the hero dies. <laughs> So what is this? <laughs> so, in one sense, the Bhagavatam, the central storyline itself is quite the antithesis of the material conception of religion. So there is religion or devotion, you could say. You can have a material conception of devotion and a spiritual conception of devotion. Most people will approach God with a material conception of devotion. And that's what 7.16 in the Bhagavad Gita says, Chatur Vidha Bhajante Maam, Janaha Sukrit No Arjuna. That four kinds of people come to him, and those who desire wealth, those who are distressed, those who are inquisitive and those who seek knowledge. But then three verses later Krishna says that Bahunam Janmanamante Jnanavan Maam Prapadyate 
and why do they surrender to me vasudeva sarvamiti samahatma sudurlabha it's 790 that krishna is saying that they it may take many lifetimes the spiritual evolution to understand that god is the supreme value so if we expect protection of god at the protection by god at the material level we we will be let down because the terms because our expectation themselves are in one sense you could say unrealistic because the material world is a place of distress and death ultimately so yes we we god can protect us at the material level also but it is primarily the absorption in the lord that is the ultimate protection and is that absorption that he offers to us through the process of bhakti so to the extent we take shelter of that absorption we become elevated so now how do we explain all this to new people now you could start with the extreme negativity and somebody says oh i am a good person but so many bad things happened to me well you could say that okay why should bad things not happen to you what do you mean you know that oh i am a good person but who said that good thing good good a good the good action should lead to good results who said that it should be like that but why if there is no god if you are going to reject god because you know you did something good but you got something bad in the result but the causal connection that good action should lead to good results what is the basis for that within the atheistic world view there is no reason for correlation of good actions and good results there is no basically the ethics or atheistic world view things happen just by impersonal mechanical forces acting upon unconscious material objects and in fact for matter there is no conception of good or bad also for unconscious matter there is just existence and interaction collision and destruction so the very idea of good and bad or good and evil uh, that itself there is no basis for that within material existence within material conception of life so our very presumption that there is a, there should be order in the world what is the basis for that presumption so atheism the problem of evil is a common argument that atheists use to try to disprove god say that uh, if god is good why is there so much evil in this world but why should there be no evil in the world why should why should good action lead to good results and bad action lead to bad results who said that what is the basis for making that claim itself but we all live that way isn't it even uh, atheists will not raise their children saying that so you do whatever you want and if you are just clever enough to get away with it everything will be wonderful no you know even an atheist will train their children you know you have to make you have to you have to keep your things carefully you have to make your bed you have to keep your this 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 we tell them then so basically we we cannot function in the world without some implicit assumption of cause effect correlation and science also functions based only on that Right. science is basically when the when newton saw the fruit falling so i had gone to london to cambridge university to speak so we passed by that same tree where newton is said to have seen the fruit falling so that tree is like a pilgrimage place for scientists <laughs> <laughs> so now when newton saw the fruit falling he asked what made the fruit fall and now that question is it's his intelligence that he came up with the idea of gravity to explain that but the point is he asked that question because there's implicit presumption that apples just don't fall by chance there is some cause effect connection so if there were no cause effect connection science could not progress at all science could not even exist so in both our daily life as well as in scientific research we have a concept of we have a presumption of cause effect connection and sometimes the expected cause does not produce the expected result then what do you do we have two choices one choice is that either there is no cause effect connection or maybe there is some more complex correlation going on over here and science almost always adopts the second so newton's law was discovered and newton's law worked very well for maybe 200 300 years but at the start of the 20th century at the start of the 20, uh, yeah 20th century they found that for subatomic particles newton's law didn't work 
due to laws of motion didn't work and for cosmic objects also it didn't work scientists didn't give up the idea that there's no cause effect connection said so maybe there's some deeper order we have found one level of order but maybe this level of order is nested in some other deeper order and that's how they came up with quantum physics for subatomic particles and relativity for cosmic objects so similarly when we we do something good and don't get the good results we have two options either we just ex reject the idea of cause effect connection but nobody functions like that if say suddenly we go to a doctor with a little we once you go to doctor with a little pain and doctor says you have cancer it's horrible you know we may get the why what did i do to get such a terrible disease you know but some many of the cancers we just don't know what is the cause but but immediately the next question we ask is what is the treatment is it curable so when we are asking it is is it curable that means we are again accepting the cause effect connection although i do not know what caused this but still i accept the cause of a connection if i take this treatment this will be this can be eliminated so the idea is we can't live without accepting cause of a connection we may not be able to specifically able to find out the cause of a connection in particular cases so that is because maybe there's a bigger framework so one bigger framework that the that the dharmic texts offer us is that there is a previous life and there's a future life so actions and the results don't come up immedi immediately always so that's a bigger framework now whether you somebody wants to accept that bigger framework or not that's up to them but the point is if we look at our ordinary way of functioning we always assume a cause effect connection and if one particular set of cause effect connection doesn't make sense we look for a, another framework within which we can place and find some cause effect connection so that's how the vedic texts offer us so does god let us down yes it can appear like that if we are looking at god only from particular frames of reference a child want uh, whatever the child child cries and the mother provides the child whatever it wants child wants food child wants water but a child wants a chocolate and the mother doesn't provide the chocolate then the child may say mother doesn't love me that's that's what that's looking within that frame of reference but then if you put in the bigger frame of reference that the mother wants to please the child but the mother also wants to protect the child and that particular case maybe eating chocolate is going to spoil the tooth of the child so she may not give so we need a bigger frame of reference and that's why if the devotion is not is not accompanied with philosophy then the devotion is not sustainable it will go on for some time but when the complexity of life uh befalls us then our devotion will start getting shaken सिद्धांत बलिया चित्ते ना करे आलस इहा है ते कृष्ण लागे सुदृढ़ मानस दैट डोंट बी लेजी अबाउट अंडरस्टैंडिंग फिलॉसफी दैट इन चतुर्थ मुझसे ये दिस इज़ ऑल फिलॉसफी आई जस्ट वांट टू हेयर लीला आई जस्ट वांट टू हैव रसा डोंट बी लाइक दैट बिकॉज़ सिद्धांत इफ यू अंडरस्टैंड इहा है ते कृष्ण लागे सुदृढ़ मानस बाय दिस आवर कॉन्शियसनेस विल बिकम फिक्स्ड ऑन कृष्ण सो फिलॉसफी गिव्स अस द राइट फ्रेम ऑफ रेफरेंस इन व्हिच टू place the events of our life so parikshit maharaj you could say is the exemplar of a good person he was pious he was devoted he was he was devoted to god he was devoted to duty and still for a small mistake he was cursed to die you know talk about a sense of disproportionate punishment it's it's horrible what he got but he put it in the right frame of reference okay maybe i was attached to the world and this is krishna's arrangement to make me attached only to him so our philosophy is meant to help us place the events of our life in the right frame of reference by which we can see those events as taking us closer to krishna and if we don't have philosophical understanding then we will just work with our default frames of reference and sometimes within that frame of reference our devotion will work i pray to god and god solves my problem but sometimes we pray to god and god doesn't solve our problem so then we need to put the things in the right frame of reference so the bhagavatam gives us various stories and in these different stories we see the characters putting their difficulties in the appropriate frame of reference and that's how they are able to move on that's how they are able to navigate life's difficulties and persevere so the, so god never lets us down provided we understand how god's loves acts in our life 
if we have the right set of expectations, the right conception of God, then we will understand God doesn't let us down. So God will never leave our hearts and go away. God will never take away from us the opportunity to remember Him. But if we expect God's protection in terms specific material terms, that may or may not happen. So thank you very much. Shri Prabhupad ki, Gaur Bhakta Vrind ki, Gaur Premanande. Thank you.